Hello, everyone. This is Monica Kuhnrads, uh, Skyping in from Connecticut. I'm the Executive Director of the Rett Syndrome Research Trust, and I'm speaking today to Dr. Jeffrey Newell. Uh, a lot of you will probably already be familiar with Dr. Newell. Um, he is the co-director of the Rett Clinic at Texas Children's Hospital. He's currently running a clinical trial, and um, he's also, many of you may also know him from the Natural History Study. Good morning, Dr. Newell. Thank you so much for joining us, taking time from your busy schedule. Good, good morning, and thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with me. So today we're going to be talking to Dr. Newell about a new project um, that RSRT uh, and Dr. Newell are launching. And um, it has to do with a topic that many of you have heard about already, um, the search for modifier genes. RSRT has been funding for a number of years a project um, in the lab of uh, Dr. Monica Justice, who is using mouse models to try to identify mutations in other genes that lessen the severity um, of having no MECP2 or a mutated MECP2. Um, because the cost of sequencing and has, has gotten more manageable, cheaper, um, and also because uh, the bioinformatics capabilities are much greater, we can now start thinking about um, looking for modifier genes in human patients. So this project that Dr. Newell will be spearheading um, is going to sequence um, exomes of high-functioning children who have MECP2 mutations, but that whom wouldn't naturally um, be diagnosed with RET because they don't meet the, the criteria, in the hopes that we might be able to find uh, secrets in their genome that might help other kids because it would open up potential targets um, for therapeutics. So uh, this is a three-year project with a um, $315,000 budget. And um, let's jump in, Dr. Newell, and I'd like to start us off by asking you if you can just tell us a bit about the, bit, uh, the bolts and nuts of this project. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, the, this project really uh, came about because I had found people in my clinic who were coming to see me who were referred because they had mutations in MECP2, common mutations that cause Rett syndrome, and these people didn't have Rett syndrome. And it really fascinated me why you could have such a variation in the clinical presentation. You could have people who maybe were diagnosed with autism or uh, pervasive developmental disorder, but had that same mutation. And, you know, there are a lot of potential causes, and we ruled out the ones we knew, like X chromosome inactivation in these people, um, and they, that didn't explain it. So there must be something more. And so I was interested in trying to figure out how we could find genetic modifiers. Now, here at Baylor College of Medicine, I uh, was very familiar and initially started uh, helping Monica Justice with her modifier screen in mice. And so, obviously, that's a great avenue, an idea that you could. there are genetic modifiers of Rett syndrome that may make the phenotypes, the clinical features, less severe. And if we could find it in mice, you know, I think the idea would be that maybe we can find it in people. And as you said, the exact details of um, the technical aspects in terms of sequencing and the bioinformatics have advanced dramatically to make this um, a realistic idea. So the nuts and bolts of it is that we are, through the Natural History Study, which has been an ongoing project funded by the NIH and the IRSF, we've accumulated a very large amount of clinical data on people with Rett syndrome and mutations. And so we, from that, we looked at that and said we can, we can take people who are phenotypically or clinically very severe or very mild, so they're at the ends of the distribution of severity, and try to use those as the subjects to sequence, like you said, the, all the genes in their body. Now, the issue that we have, and one of the big challenges moving forward, is that although that has been a great resource to uh, get a number of people to do this on, we still want to capture more people. Because from the natural history study, we can probably identify about 100 people total on, on, the, on the two ends, 50 people who are more severe and 50 people who are milder who have typical disease-causing mutations. But we know that there are a number of other people out there who have mutations who are so mild, maybe they even haven't been recognized as RET. And so one of our big challenges is really trying to tap into those groups of people and recruit them into this, this study that I'm describing now. So... Um 
can you tell us, since we're able to also go outside of the natural history and, and tap into other kids, um, I think it's going to be really important to figure out what are the criteria that we're going to be looking at. What symptoms are you looking at? So can you tell us a little bit about the type of individual that we're, that we're trying to find um, so that if someone watching this says, hey, that, that sounds like my child. Um, so what are we looking for? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question and a challenging one too because um, we only have very broad strokes of what kind of things we'd look for. What I would say is that we want to find any anybody who has a mutation in MECP2, especially people who have a mutation in MECP2 who are do not meet the clinical features of typical Rett syndrome. So, and there are a handful of these people, and I think they're hard to identify because they don't we have yet to identify real distinctive characteristics. So, but of the people that I do know of, they had a variety of social interaction abnormalities, some learning problems, and the degree of severity can be variable. So, we had some, we had one child who um, really actually was very, rather high functioning, had some obsessive compulsive and attention issues, but actually, you know, had a, had a relatively normal IQ. Whereas some of the other children had um, pretty severe autistic features and uh, really did, they spoke but only in very short um, sentences but didn't have any hand problems. So I think we have to keep a broad, uh, uh, um, cast a broad net and it's hard for me to tell exactly clinically. The one thing I will say is that more and more girls who don't have the clinical features of Rett syndrome are getting tested for MECP2 mutations. And if that, and so we're identifying more of these people. So if those people ever show up, we would love to hear from them and try to enroll them in this study. But these might be kids who have language, even though it's not, you know, at age level, but who, who have language, who motorically are in pretty good shape, who walk, who run, who can climb the stairs, who have some hand function. Um, so, as you all, say... All of those things, definitely. Yep. Yeah. So, as you say, I guess, it, you know, let's be broad and give you an opportunity to assess them um, and rule them in or rule them out. Um, yes. So, if, you know, if I and others and through social media we get the word out, uh, if a parent says, this could be my daughter, um, what do they do? What, what should they do? Well, I think probably obviously the best, a, a very easy thing to do is to, you know, work, you know, contact the RSRT. And I know that the RSRT will definitely put them in touch with me. They can also directly call the Bluebird Circle Red Clinic at Texas Children's Hospital. The number of that is 832-822-7388. So that's RET, so the last four numbers spelled RET. And asked to speak to you. Yeah, then they they can leave their information. If they can get in touch with me, the office will try to get in touch with me if they can. But otherwise, get the information and I'll get back to them. Yeah, and, and, and as you suggested, they can also contact me at RSRT. I can start to put some preliminary information together, pass it on to you. Absolutely. Um, do you think these will be kids that you will have to see in person, or or do you think with Skype and videos and talking to the parents, you'll be able to get a picture, clinical picture? I would love to see people in person, but I understand the challenges of traveling. And so I think we can try to work out things that can be done by phone calls, Skype, uh, exchanging medical information. And I think I can make a pretty decent assessment of uh, that if they're not meeting the situation for Rett syndrome. Okay. Um, one of the aspects of this project that I found uh, attractive is that um, all of the sequencing data and all of the phenotypic data will be deposited in a uh, database, uh, the National Database for Autism Research, and will be available to the scientific community. Um, Sorry. Sure. Hey, Jeff, this is Adriano. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so I was saying all of the sequencing data and all the phenotypic data will be deposited in the National Database for Autism Research, which is an NIH-funded program. Um, I think it's really valuable to, to share this information. Can, mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit and, and also address how, um, you know, what are the safeguards that are put in place to protect um, the genetic information of individuals? Yeah, you know, sharing genetic information uh, amongst researchers is really critical. Um, because the 
we any one individual may not be able to um, really understand everything in genetics, and I think that it's it's become the standard of practice that these this genetic information is deposited into databases for other researchers to tap into and for them to maybe explore it in ways that the primary researcher didn't think of in the first place. Now, the, it does raise certain safety issues of privacy and concerns like that. But um, we try, and the National Institutes of Health has devised a variety of methods to try to prohibit um, people using this information in ways that they shouldn't. So, um, meaning using it for, you know, in d discriminatory practices or insurance, denying insurance. And so, really, there are no names associated with any of the information that's placed there. And although it's a it's quote unquote a public database. It's actually not just broadly available. You have to be an approved researcher to be able to access the data. And so there's a standardized process to go through to establish that you are really somebody who has a reason, a legitimate scientific reason to look at the data. Right. So there's no names and the access is restricted to legitimate scientific purposes. Right. Now, the concept of modifiers certainly is not unique to Rett syndrome. This, this is a, a well-known genetic scenario that, that happens probably in every disease, right, and, and helps to explain why some people are, are more severe, less severe, why they might um, do well with a certain drug or not do well, um, or why some people are susceptible to z disease and, and not. So I just wanted to make that point. Do you want to... Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And I think that this is a – people have known for a while some of the things like um, certain susceptibility to bad um, side effects of drugs. Certain uh, genetic changes can predict if you're going to react badly to a drug. And so that's really kind of the beginning of this concept almost of what we call personalized medicine where um, some people have genetic risks – um, that are unique to themselves, and you can look at the, their genetic composition and help guide your therapies. So in that situation, um, you know, you can help decide if someone can be on a drug or not. More recently, people have been pushing this idea of a modifier, and really probably the best example was in cystic fibrosis, where they were able to identify changes in a gene that determined how likely it was that someone was going to get an other infection, a bacterial infection. And it really gave insight into the disease process that people didn't realize before. And it really will probably both help, um, you know, initially you could say, well, that would help if you looked at that gene type, you could say, well, you're more at risk. You have cystic fibrosis, but you're at more at risk of getting this bacterial infection. So we might need to change our therapies. But it also hopefully will provide insight into the pathology so you can modify um, the treatments for everyone to prevent these things. And that's really where we want to see a project like this go. You know, what we hope is that we'd be able to define genetic modifiers of Rett syndrome. Not, I mean, obviously, so we could predict um, why someone might be more severe or less severe. But really, if we could find genetic changes that are protective if we could understand what those genetic changes are doing to the function of these proteins, then we might be able to mimic this with drugs. And that's really where we want to go with this kind of project, is we want to find things that will give us an insight to develop new therapies. Right. Now, when, you, when the proposal went through the peer review process, the, you know, the reviewers were not shy about saying this was a rather high-risk proposal. Um, in terms of building uh, a resource for the scientific community, that, that's not high risk. This is going to be a database that hopefully will grow over time um, and, and, will, and will be a, a rich resource of information. Now, whether we'll actually be able to identify modifiers is the, is the risky piece. But, you know, I think that's where foundations like, like ours should step up and, um, you know, fund riskier projects that might not be funded through more traditional agencies. And, and also, it's the kind of thing that we won't, we don't know until we do it. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, the NIH, by its very nature, um, is extraordinarily conservative. And it really takes, um, you know, a foundation to say, you know, look, we want to take a chance because we think this has a high reward. 
and we're going to put you know put a little and, and put some money in because hopefully that parlays into like you said a broader project that maybe once you establish that it's it's working it, that it's existing it can be seek outside funding i think that this is a great way to parlay into larger funding but i think it is absolutely true this is a risky project by the nature and like you said the reviewers were not shy about that and i think we all understand that that's the nature of it i think the point the main point is that it is risky for us in the relatively small sample we have to discover modifier but i think where there is low or no risk is that we will have this banked information linked to clinical information um, that can be mined for a long time and so the what we say is the pure discovery that just from this human genetic information we'll be able to find modifiers has a high degree of risk however we know from the mouse work that there are modifiers and there are more genetic modifiers in mice that just need further refinement or are yet to be discovered. As we learn more of those with the sequencing data available and publicly available to researchers, they'll be able to mine that database and determine if their favorite gene candidate is present in these human populations, if mutations in those genes are present. And that will really give a lot of strength to um, show that, that those animal work or those the ideas really pan out well because they exist in humans. Right. So this is a project where we're really seeking uh, partnership with the RET community uh, at large. Um, we need your help. Uh, Dr. Newell has you know X number of patients within his natural history study, but there's lots lots more individuals out there. And if um, what we describe sounds reminiscent about your child or a child that you may have met. Um, somewhere along your RET journey, then we really encourage you to contact me, contact Dr. Newell, um, and, and let's determine whether your, help, your child may help us figure out how we might be able to help, you know, all RET kids. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Newell. We, well, uh, one, one final thing I just sure. want to add to what you just said. Um, I think they, the people, we are extremely interested in people who have MECP2 mutations who do not have RET syndrome. However, we also are very interested in the very high functioning people with Rett syndrome. So people who really do have Rett syndrome, but you know, who maybe can speak in sentences and maybe can write. Uh, so, but they do really carry a true diagnosis of Rett syndrome. We're definitely interested in those people too. Okay. Well, we wish you a lot of luck. And Thank you. Um, we look forward to getting updates and sharing them with, with our community. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Bye-bye.